Okay. So thank you for the introduction. Thanks to the organizer for giving me the chance to speak here today. So in this talk, I would like to present you a work that I've uh, done recently uh, on the study of uh, uh, vector reaction in uh, our models uh, the grid. So in particular, I used a Poseidon sand condensate as a quantum simulator of a cosmological pretty. And so this work basically is a something that set itself in the broader area of our models of priority and cosmology or more general. Okay, I'm going with, uh, with the here because I believe you know where we're uh, speaking about. So the Breathing is the last stage of the cosmic inflation when the infraton field uh, falls off the potential plateau and starts oscillating at the bottom of this potential graph. And these oscillations basically parallel imply the vacuum fluctuation that are in the matter fields that are coupled to the infraton itself and create particles in the universe. So this is the mechanism by which we believe matter has been created during the journey. So by using this other models that I'm going to show you in a second, uh, I'm focusing here on the study of the direction effect, uh, that is how this parametric amplification of the matter field affect the dynamics of the infraton field. So how this dynamics is modified by these processes. So why we need our simulator to do that? Well, uh, the thing is that the back correction in the breathing is a non perturbative problem where interaction are strong and then quantum effects are important. So now we notice the fundamental physics of a condensed matter and our model is of course an advantage. But also, maybe even more importantly, we can uh, think in the near future to carry out experiments in a lab with condensed matter systems where this effect of the back correction can be actually seen in our tabletop experiments. For example, here I would like to mention the experiments that are ongoing at the BC Center in Trento, who I collaborate with, but also there are other uh, groups uh, moving in the direction of the back, studying the back reaction with other models, uh, such as uh, just an hour of the Tech in Israel or Sister Very Fortune in, uh, in uh, Nottingham in the UK. Uh, but why studying the back reaction in a condensed matter system should teach us anything about back reaction in cosmology in gravity? So the microscopic physics of a condensed matter system has nothing to do with the uh, microscopic physics of the planet scale of, uh, of gravity. Mm -hmm. So the reason is that the back reaction is uh, something that uh, happens at a mesoscopic level in which the details of the microscopic physics is uh, uh, really not uh, that important. So. In that sense, uh, back reaction effects are universal, and the basic mechanisms that derive these effects are the same, no matter if we really consider a condensed matter system or analog or a uh, actual cosmological or gravitational model, or gravitational system, sorry. So that is the framework of this uh, work and of this talk. Okay, so this is the analog system that I'm using. So it is a two-dimensional Bosnian sun condensate that uh, I consider for my numerical simulation in a ring-shaped configuration. But that was mainly for numerical ease, it's not really a physical requirement. You can just have instead a cigar shaped condensate, and that would be perfectly the same. So the transverse modes in this uh, system are my analogs of the infraton field, while the longitudinal modes are the analogs uh, of the matter fields instead. And in order to implement these oscillations of the infraton at the bottom of this potential, what I do is to give a kick to the system in transverse direction. So basically, I uh, give an initial spike to the trapping frequency, the transverse trapping frequency, in such a way that the system starts oscillating in the breathing mode. So it's like a breathing oscillations. Uh, so in this way, uh, so basically what I was I'm interested to do is again study uh, the back reaction, so study how the energy in, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is in these transverse oscillations is get transferred into the longitudinal modes and focusing on how this process affects the dynamics of the transverse oscillations, which are again are the analogs of the infraton degrees of freedom. So the way by which the transverse and the longitudinal modes interact with each other is because of the standard uh, atomic interactions. So atomic interactions in this analog system are the analogs of the infraton and matter interaction. Okay. So uh, basically to study this problem, I need to solve for the dynamics of a BC. 
And to that end, what I use is a semi-classical phase-based method that is based on the Wigner representation of the density matrix of the system. So the Wigner uh, function is a quasi probability distribution that is defined uh, in terms of this uh, symmetric order characteristic function. So these are the, the features of the simple single mode uh, system, but in translation to the multi-mode case, like uh, VC is needed to just substitute variables and operators with the field variables and field operators. So working within the Wigner representation, uh, the evolution of the density matrix takes uh, this form here, so I plug it into this equation, the VC Hamiltonian. Uh, this Hamiltonian is uh, composed by a kinetic term plus the term that takes uh, into account the interactions between atoms, and this the results in the Wigner uh, picture. So you see that this uh, is an integral differential equation in which there are two main terms. One, the first one accounts for main field effects of the dynamics. The second term instead, uh, which is a third order derivative of the field, accounts for strictly quantum effects. Now the problem is uh, solving this equation, which is difficult. And the main reason is that it's not possible in general to uh, find a mapping into a stochastic process that can help simulate in these dynamics. So that mapping is only possible when this second order term, this second term uh, is neglected. And that approximation is called the truncated Wigner approximation. And that is the approximation I'm working with here. So by neglecting this term, basically uh, the evolution of the BC uh, is, a, is a governed by only the mean <coughs> effects. So it is a classical evolution uh, ruled by the gross Pitayevsky equation. However, notice that, notice that by neglecting uh, this type here, we are not completely neglecting quantum fluctuation from the problem. Because quantum fluctuation are still encoded in the system, but only in the initial condition. So my initial condition is a quantum state, but the following evolution is classical and uh, is governed by the Gospitaeus equation. So what is my initial state is the Borgler vacuum, which is the composition of the Borgler, of the condensate wave function at equilibrium, this uh, file here, uh, which is the, basically the solution of the stationary Gospitaeus equation, plus a term is to account for the quantum fluctuation that are in the Borgler vacuum, and this term is uh, constructed as usual as a combination of the Borgler of ion modes, the standard U and V functions, which are weighted by these uh, beta variables, which are some Gaussian random variables which mimic the quantum noise that is encoded in the vacuum state, the Borgler vacuum state. So basically, I've performed a Monte Carlo simulation in which I prepare different samples of this initial state and evolve each of these samples according to the gross pitayevsky equation. And any quantum expectation value is calculated in this picture as a standard stochastic expectation value. Okay. On the right side, I report a typical spectrum for this uh, two-dimensional two system. So there are different excitation branches, one for each transverse mode of the ring. Uh, <coughs> here I report the first three uh, branches that uh, uh, I work with, which are the constant branch, the dipole, and the within branches, which correspond respectively to modes in the transverse direction with zero, one, or two nodes. Okay. And the modes in each branch are indexed by the longitudinal wave vector. So this index n is a discrete index because we have a ring, uh, which accounts for the longitudinal wave vector. So let's go to the results now. Uh, I start at equal zero with the system in the Bobby Road vacuum. So on the left side, I show you, I'm showing you the population in each mode of the system. And so you see that it's completely flat because uh, only vacuum fluctuation or only zero point fluctuation are in each mode. After a certain amount of time, I give uh, a kick to the transfer step of frequency, as I mentioned before, in such a way that the system starts oscillating the transfer mode. So basically, I'm preparing my system in this uh, mode here at k equals zero in the proofing branch, and I let the system evolve. And uh, after a few oscillations, what happens is that uh, uh, these uh, oscillations parametrically amplify the vacuum fluctuation that are in their resonance modes between the dipole and Goldstone branches, which have a, a, a k, a wave vector differences. So it's a down conversion process. 
And you see this effect into this establishment of uh, massive peaks at this, uh, resonant, uh, in these resonant modes, both in the diagonal and the goldstone branches. So here the color scheme of the two figures is the same. Green is for breathing, blue for diagonal, and black for goldstone branches. Also notice the appearance of uh, smaller peaks, which are the results of nonlinear processes. So basically, if you are given by, of course, interactions, basically they are the result of the scattering between quasi particles from these uh, uh, two, two resonant peaks, with combi uh, different combination of them. For example, this peak at 10 and equal to 51 is given by scattering one particle from this peak and one particle for this peak, because remember that uh, the longitudinal moment has to be conserved because the system is a modulus there. All right, but uh, parameter amplification is uh, really a test field effect. So here there is no back correction yet. The first effect of back correction should be dissipation of the transverse oscillations because uh, uh, the energy that, are, that is stored in the transverse modes gets uh, redistributed in the longitudinal direction. So the transverse oscillation should get uh, done somehow. And that is what uh, is shown in this slide. So here on the left, I'm reporting again the population in uh, the time evolution of the population this time, uh, both in the breathing mode at k equals zero. Here there are some, there should be some shaded area that are not visible, but anyway. So these uh, uh, population here are the population of the breathing mode at k equals zero that I initially excited, and the population integrated in these uh, resonant peaks. So the population of the resonant peak peaks uh, exponentially grows in time, and that's uh, expected because it's a parametric amplification process. But at a certain point, this uh, uh, growth stops because of the onset of endolinearities. So uh, they saturate at a certain point. And when the desaturation occurs, there is a massive back correction effect onto the transverse oscillations. So you see that uh, at uh, early time, the population of the pretty mode is pretty much constant, but when this saturation occurs, so when nonlinearities start playing a role, there is a, a um, dramatic change in the dynamics of the pretty mode. So it's certainly going this uh, uh, see that quasi uh, evolution that, uh, I mean, and so you see that there is a clear dumping of this uh, transverse selection because it energy is transferred in the longitudinal mode. But notice that uh, 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 dissipation is an effect of the back correction that, strictly speaking, can be captured by performing a semi classical study of the problem. So, at this qualitatively, you can get the dissipation, even if not with these uh, uh, details that are shown here. Uh, but I was uh, really interested in this uh, work uh, to study effects of the back correction that they go behind the semi classical level, which means that are really triggered by quantum fluctuations. And identify the effect of this kind in the defacing of the transverse oscillations. So basically, what I studied was uh, um, uh, to study the uh, correlation of the oscillations along the ring at different positions. So why the fluctuation, the transverse fluctuation at one position, are correlated to the fluctuation at another position? So this information is encoded in this standard uh, special correlation function, where W is the transverse size of the PC with uh, respect to this uh, uh, reference value. And that is the result. So at the early time, just after the kick in the transverse direction, this correlation are flat because the ring oscillates uh, transversely in phase at each special position. But at later time, instead, you see that uh, these correlations are sharply big, and that is a clear evidence of the defacing. And the physical origin of this defacing is uh, related to the fact that we are uh, exciting vacuum fluctuation in the longitudinal modes in the different uh, branches. And the phase of each of these modes is completely random. So when these modes back react on the transverse modes, this, uh, um, this uh, random phase uh, determines this chaotic uh, evolution, and so this uh, defacing effect. So with that, I conclude by giving the main take out to this talk. So I use a two-dimensional BC as an analog simulator of the creating of the early universe in, and uh, uh, identify the infinite degrees of freedom in the transverse modes of this uh, system, while the matter degrees of freedom the longitudinal modes instead. I observe the test field effect that are the parametric amplification of the zero point fluctuation in the longitudinal modes, which are induced by these uh, transverse oscillations. 
but also observe the curtain effects both at the semi-classical level, uh, in particular in the damping of these uh, transverse oscillations, but also behind, uh, particularly in the, the phasing of the trans oscillations. With that, I would like to uh, acknowledge Yamoko Rusotto from the BC Center in Trento who collaborated to this work, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Please, the questions. We have, uh, we have five minutes. Uh, Nick. I can shout the word. Thank you. Very interesting work. Uh, two things. In the real cosmology, of course, the system is relativistic. I guess, but it's nice that you abstracted the relevant uh, degrees of freedom, like what we do in superconductivity. You only consider this. But, do you think in the real uh, cosmology the relativistic effects could play some additional role uh, compared well, to the Bose-Einstein condensate system? Or? So the, the condensate uh, is a little, so the dispersion relation is uh, linear at low momentum. All right. Ah. And uh, so here basically I'm modeling uh, both a uh, massless branch and a mass uh, a massive branch. So you have the relativistic unit at low momentum. Yeah. At low momentum. But uh, yeah, at the high moment there is the Lorentz uh, gradient. Yeah, that's the point. Do you think that would be a, a difference, a difference in uh, the realistic system for the predictions? Uh, I because you would get all the spectrum. In, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I expect not because uh, uh, speaking about uh, other uh, other effects that are being actually uh, investigating a lot, like the gradation with the angular mm -hmm. models uh, with a BC and something like this one. So they saw that the open radiation is exactly the same. Okay. So it's curve bust. Okay. And so I believe it's, it's going to be the same as so again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Any more questions? I have actually a curiosity, man. Mm. How, because we say that at some point you get the dissipation by transferring energy from this uh, uh, transverse to longitudinal mode. Uh, how you check energy conservation with the I can not, I'm not able to, to see. Uh, well, the evolution is unity, so energy yeah. has to be conserved. No, I mean, just from the numerics, I, I would, would like to. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to check if. I yeah, can. I mean, you need to basically integrate this uh, yeah. spectra with respect to the population and the energy of this yeah. moment. So I should, I'm sure it's worth it. It was my question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so let's move on if there are no more questions. And uh, thanks. Uh,